name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. All the unity prayer to blind the evil one. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. My adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. And here's a little prayer. This was written by St. Louis de Montfort, and it's only three lines. But John Paul recommended this little prayer as a renewal of our consecration every day. Just three beautiful little lines. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I, I adore you, Lord Jesus, and I love you, Lord Jesus, through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And the other version, I am all thine, Lord Jesus, and all that I have is thine, through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Amen. Now we're reconsecrated. St. Pope Pius XII, who wrote about the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, in one of his encyclical letters, and he actually said this. He said, devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus he says, is actually devotion to the Holy Spirit. Very fascinating. So this is the Vicar of Christ, and of course all the Vicars of Christ have the gift of infallibility when they're teaching authoritatively. And this particular Pope, though, Pius XII, was unusually brilliant. And so to hear this you know, from his, from his pen, from his lips, that devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which is an ancient devotion, so to speak, for hundreds of years, from St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, and really dating back to the Gospel, where St. John laid his head on the breast of Jesus, on the chest of Jesus, to hear his beating heart. That's really where the Sacred Heart devotion begins, is at the Last Supper with the Apostle St. John. And so to hear the Holy Father summarize this really in our times, that this devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus is devotion to the Holy Spirit. Because what is it that animates the heart of God? What animates the heart of Jesus? Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's the source of the Holy Spirit. And so when we honor and love and are devoted to and worship the sacred heart of Jesus, we're honoring the love of Jesus. But then Augustine said, love is the name of the Holy Spirit. So the love of the Father and the love of Jesus is another person. It's a living person, the Holy Spirit. And so there's our first connection with today's topic in the Holy Spirit. We just have the feast day of the sacred heart of Jesus. And that which animates his heart is precisely the Holy Spirit. That's what makes his heart so sacred, you might say. And he wants to share that with us. And so our goal really is that at least by the time we leave this earth is that we have sacred hearts too. We need to have sacred hearts. And by the way, several Holy Fathers did mention this, that the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which is the devotion to the Holy Spirit, is centered on the Eucharist. And so whenever you and I spend time at Mass and at adoration, we are in the presence of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And that's why it's absolutely phenomenal and really, the New York Times and CNN and all of the major media should have this on the front page in their front top story, that when the Eucharistic miracles, which are undeniable, there's a new one now in Poland that was just approved a few weeks ago, 
that when these Eucharistic miracles, when the bread and wine that are consecrated by the priest or the bishop into the body and blood of Jesus, the God-man, sometimes at Mass or after Mass, that consecrated host or wine physically has the, the visible um, attributes of the flesh of Jesus Christ. We actually can see the flesh and the blood. And so in these miracles, when the Church has allowed science to test them, which she normally does, because we're not afraid of science. Really, the science was born from the Catholic Church. The science we have today was born from the Catholic Church. We love science. And science always proves the holy Catholic faith. It always does. True faith and true science always support one another. So here's some of the latest findings of our science that tells us when these um, Eucharistic miracles have been tested, even in our own time, they turn out to be heart tissue, cardiac tissue, repeatedly on all of them. The Eucharist, when it is, we're given that miracle to become actual the body and blood of Christ visible to the sight, when it actually we receive those miracles and that's tested, that flesh is heart tissue. That's part of it, too. It's like even this most recent test from Poland, this most recent one, I mean, like in the last year the tests were done, are saying the same thing that the other tests have said on the other miracles, that this heart tissue, I think they use the word striated, but in that striated tissue, there's evidence that the, per the person to whom this heart belongs was tortured, was abused, was, was mm -hmm. physically harmed in a profound way, in a life-threatening way in a mortal way. They can see that from the heart tissue. Mm. And so these, these Eucharistic miracles are all showing us that it's precisely it is the sacred heart of Jesus present physically at every Mass. And a heart that's been wounded, yes, Jack, wounded out of love for us. Incredible. Yeah. And that's why when we spend time with the sacred heart of Jesus in the Eucharist, uh, that, there is the privileged place to receive the Holy Spirit. Because that's the spirit that animates the Eucharist and animates the heart of God. It is the Holy Spirit. So if we want more of the Holy Spirit, then spend time with the Sacred Heart. And he's found right there in the tabernacle. He's found there at the Mass. And that's true for all of us. And we long for the day, which we believe may be coming soon, when the entire world, all of our brothers and sisters and all the other religions will know beyond a shadow of a doubt and with scientific certainty that Jesus Christ is the one Savior of the world, and he is truly and actually present in the Blessed Sacrament. We wait for that day, and we pray for it to come soon. So all division and all violence stops, and we are united under one Jesus and under one sacrament of the Eucharist. Amen? So the Sacred Heart of Jesus' feast and devotion really is devotion to the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of love. Now, the other feast that we just celebrated is the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And the Virgin Mary herself, she is called the spouse of the Holy Spirit. So isn't it interesting that the very next day we celebrate another feast that very much is proximate, is close to the Holy Spirit? profoundly does Mary reflect her spouse. And, you know, you sort of see this sometimes. It's actually funny when you work with married couples for many years. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but they kind of begin to look like each other. I don't know how that works, but I've seen it so many times when you would least expect it that the husband and wife begin to look like each other mm -hmm. after 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. Kind of an amazing thing. Spouses begin to reflect each other. Well, Mama, Mama Mary, is the bride of the Holy Spirit and the temple of the Holy Spirit, and she reflects him so perfectly that one of our great saints of recent years, St. Maximilian Kolbe, he said that if the Holy Spirit, if he were to have taken flesh like, like Jesus did, Jesus is the Word of God, the second person of the Trinity, when he took flesh, he became the God-man, Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit never took flesh. But St. Maximilian says that if he had taken flesh, if he had become incarnate as the second person had done, then you know what he would look like? 
he would look exactly like the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, that's an amazing statement Mm -hmm. from an amazing saint. Mm -hmm. He said, if you want to know what those would look like, he says, look at the Virgin Mary. That's what he would have looked like if he had taken flesh. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Now, he's a he, but you see, he is the comforter. The Holy Spirit is called the comforter, the sweet consolation of the soul, the sweet guest of the soul. Well, who in the family is the comforter? It's usually Mama. I mean, it might be Dad sometimes, but it's usually Mama who's the consoler or the comforter. And so it would make sense then that the feminine, you might say, the feminine attributes of God, which are also godly, that you would find those in the Holy Spirit in a particular way. He's still a he, but he has those feminine characteristics of of this great gentleness and purity and love and consolation and gentleness. So these are amazing developments in theology approved by the Church. So the Immaculate Heart of Mary really is a place where the Holy Spirit dwells, just like with Jesus. And in a certain way, Mary is a mirror of the Holy Spirit. This is what he looks like. He's gentle and pure and kind. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And these are the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the special fruitfulness of his work that show forth in us when we're faithful in our Christian life. And there are 12 traditional fruits, although some lists have nine, and the 12 includes those nine. But when you look at those gifts or those fruits of the Holy Spirit, it it looks like a painting of Mary. And here they are. This is from, from Galatians and also from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. But the fruits of the Holy Spirit are charity, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, generosity, gentleness, faithfulness, modesty, self-control, and chastity. My goodness, I mean, there is a portrait of the Virgin Mary. Mm. And it's, it's interesting that in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, it speaks of this woman who is um, clothed with the sun, with a moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. A crown of 12 stars. And could those 12 stars possibly be these 12 sublime fruits of the Holy Spirit? This is who Mary is. She is charity. She is joy. She is peace. Just think of it. Charity. She's called the queen of charity and the mother of fair love. One of her titles. Think of joy. She's, she's called the cause of our joy. Think of peace. She is the queen of peace. All of these, you see, these really describe Mary to a T. And so Mary was utterly faithful to the Holy Spirit every moment of her life, even from her conception. She was united to him like glue. And Mary invites us to join her in this union with the Holy Spirit, that we can become immaculate like her. And the closer we follow Jesus, using Mary as her model, the more these fruits, these 12 fruits, begin to shine forth in each of us. So if you want to know where the tree is, where you can pick these fruit, the tree is in the heart of Mary, in the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Well, the Mediatrix or the Mediatrix is actually a feminine, a feminine suffix uh, to the Latin word mediator. So Mediatrix is a mediator who is feminine. So that's where the I-X comes in. So Mary is a feminine intercessor for the human race. She's not equal to Jesus. She's subservient to Jesus. But she is um, the example par excellence of what all of us are called to be. Because all of us are called to mediate the Holy Spirit to one another, to mediate his love in particular and the fruits of his love to each other. So Mary is the mediatrix par excellence. And she's the one that she works in union with her son, Jesus. Um, She's like the co-pilot. And, you know, when you have an airplane or a train, the co-pilot is not equal to the pilot by any means. The pilot is the boss, and co-pilot is the assistant. 
So Mary, in a sense, is the co-pilot or the co the co-mediatrix, you might say, with the Lord Jesus, and she's become like a funnel or a channel of grace. It's her Son's holy will. It's the Father's will too. It's the Spirit's will that all graces should come to mankind from Jesus, but through the heart of Mary. This is God's sovereign will. Um, I don't know, but. I believe that part of the reasoning in God's perfect and loving mind is that our first mother, Eve, she really, she shattered the plan of God for the human race. And Adam did too with her. And so that our beautiful God, in restoring his finest creation, which is the human race, he did not want to just raise up for us a mediator, a savior, this beautiful and handsome, intelligent, courageous Jesus. He needed to do something to have someone who would also raise up the fairer half of the human race. So that not only is the dignity of man restored, but the dignity of woman is restored. We fell through the teamwork of Adam and Eve, a, a sad teamwork. And so God wants to raise us up through another team of Jesus and Mary. And so that more than likely, there's a good possibility, that is what God's reasoning is, that women are not to be despised in any way, that through the Lord Jesus and his co-pilot, Mother Mary, God is restoring the entire human race, and that every man should strive to be like Jesus and every woman should strive to be like Mary, so to speak. This may be where his reasoning comes in. More than that, Our Lady represents the human race. She represents all of us. It's kind of interesting that mother comes from the Latin word mater, which really is the root for our word matter, M-A-T-T-E-R. Our word matter, like anything physical, anything created, that this word matter comes from mater. Mother is the same, has the same root word. And so our mother, Mary, represents the matter of the human race, the matter of creation. She represents all of us before God. And so what we had lost, you might say, by Eve, we have found again by Mary. Eve had a fallen angel come to her, and she took the bait. But Our Lady had a holy, faithful angel, Gabriel, come to her, and she took that holy bait. She said yes. She didn't say no. She said yes. And so in a very special and pristine way, Mary represents the human race, standing before God and saying, yes, I want the Savior. We need the Savior. We want Jesus. We say yes to Jesus. Let him come now, and I give you my body. Give him flesh now to save all of us. That's the beautiful mother. In a certain way, she represents the human race, saying yes to God's plan, and thereby giving flesh to the Lord Jesus, giving him entry into the world. The Father did not want to send Jesus like Superman, full-grown, with no mother or no father on the earth, because then there'd be like a bit of a distance between him and us. We couldn't fully relate to that. It'd be like, like Superman in the movies. He wanted to send his son the same way that we came, as a zygote, as a little tiny cell that's dividing in a mother's womb. He became one of us, a baby in the womb, and was born like every one of us. And God needed a perfect vessel for this. That was Our Lady to give him her spotless flesh, but also her perfect yes for mankind. At that moment, when Mary conceived the God-man and then gave birth to him, that's what most theologians tell us. That's the source of her role as mediatrix of all grace. It begins there. When she gave us Jesus, she gave us everything. God could not barge in on the human race. He would not do that. As some writers say, God's a gentleman. He wouldn't do that. He knocks on the door. He said it himself, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man openeth, I will come in and sup with him. But the whole world was lost in sin. 
God roamed everywhere, and he found one spotless soul that was willing to say yes, yes. He knocked on the door of her heart. She said, yes, Father, yes, send me your son, because I, too, I yearn for salvation for my fellows, for the human race. He found the one he was looking for. And so St. Bernard of Clairvaux says in his beautiful homily, he's talking to Mary in one of his beautiful middle, mid-age homilies, and he says, Mama Mary, Virgin Mary, say yes. Don't wait. Don't wait. No, we need Jesus. Don't hesitate. Mama, say yes. Bring him down. It's a beautiful homily by St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Mary, you might say, is mankind's yes to God. And Jesus is God's answer. It, what it brings to my mind is the idea of what John Paul used to call the life project, that our, our life is a project. In other words, we have a mission in life. And you might say that that mission could be summarized in this thought, that we are called to become holy. We are called to become saints. So we are each our fruit trees. And you might want to put it this way, that at the moment of our baptism, the seed of a fruit tree was planted in our souls. Sanctifying grace came into us at that moment we were baptized, and a new growth occurred. So that I was no longer, you might say, simply human or simply of this earth. But at that moment of baptism, I became adopted by the Holy Trinity, adopted by God. And divinization occurred. That's an actual word we use in the Catholic Church. It's a very important word in theology. We are divinized by the presence of God, in particular the Holy Spirit, inside of us. So the seed of divinization, this seed of a new fruit tree that has the fruit of holiness, was placed in us at baptism. Then we grow in prayer. We grow through the instructions of our parents. In particular way, when we receive the seven sacraments, the other sacraments, that fruit tree it grows and grows. And the idea is that we start bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That in time, as we use the sacraments and use the gifts of wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and counsel, of fortitude and piety and fear of the Lord, of faith and hope and love and, and even the gift of justice and temperance, when you start using these virtues and gifts, something happens. It's like the sap flowing through the tree. And soon enough, the tree will bear fruit. Our Lord Jesus in the Gospel, he made this you know, strikingly apparent on several occasions. But there's that time, you remember, when he, he went by a tree and he basically cursed the tree. And he was looking for figs, I suppose, on the fig tree. There were leaves, but there were no figs. And it's really funny how the Lord, he looked at the tree, he's the boss, he looked at the tree and he says, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the Bible says the fig tree withered at once. Boom, it withered and died. Well, you see, the Lord wasn't being mean. The apostles were watching him and he knew they were watching him. If anyone had eyes in the back of his head, Jesus did. And he knew the apostles were watching him. He was trying to give them a lesson for all time that we are the fig tree, we are the fruit tree, and it's not enough to put on a good show to have shiny green leaves, like to look like we're good and holy, but not really be so. And so he says, you have to bear fruit. You have to be like my father, you have to be like me. In time, he would tell us through the saints, be like my mother, too. And so Jesus, in and, and every fruit tree, he's looking for fruit. If he expects to find it on a fig tree, he surely expects to find it in a Catholic, in a Christian. He's looking for those fruits. And so our life is supposed to be fruitful. It's not dead and should not be boring. That life is an adventure. And we get this fruit by following Jesus. We follow him through the, precisely through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. As we follow the Lord and listen to the Holy Spirit and make wise decisions and say no to sin and express love, all of a sudden, these fruits all become manifest in our lives. 
And even the people around us notice these amazing fruits in you and I. They begin to see maybe someone who was hateful uh, a, a year ago, now following Jesus, is loving everyone and actually happy and joyful. There seems to be an end result, you might say, of following Jesus by using the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We become like Jesus from the inside out. We start becoming patient and kind and good and generous and, and chaste. We stop making excuses for impurity, but rather we start saying yes to perfect purity like Jesus and like Mary. And so we have a job. We are like in an orchard. The church is an orchard, and we are the trees in that orchard, and we have to bear this beautiful fruit. Why? Because uh, I won't fit in heaven otherwise. I won't fit in heaven. The book of Revelation tells us that in heaven there is a river of the water of life in heaven. And it's bright as crystal, and it flows from the throne of God, and it goes down the middle of the street of the city, of the new Jerusalem and heaven. And there, what is there? There are trees on both sides of the river, and these trees are bearing fruit. Now, we won't even fit in there if we are dead. We have to have, we have to be fruit trees ourselves. It's quite possible that that's a mystical illusion in Revelation 22 to the saints who are those trees of life there. But it's interesting that the Bible goes on to say in the book of Revelation, which we may be living through right now, the book of Revelation, that there are 12 kinds of fruit, 12 kinds of fruit on these trees. So we won't even fit into heaven. So when I die, God's going to look at me. He's going to say, lift up your branches. He's looking for fruit, apples and oranges and peaches and pears and all of these beautiful fruits inside of us. And all of those fruits really, when you come right down to it, these are reflections of the personality of Jesus Christ. They're reflections of who Jesus was and is. They are really dimensions of love, these 12 fruits of the Holy Spirit. Of course, the traditional number is nine. We get that from the book of Galatians. I'll quote that here real quick from Galatians chapter 5. St. Paul says, in contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and generosity, faithfulness and gentleness, and self-control. So beautiful. And he goes on, actually, after that. There's actually three more verses after that, and that's probably where the fathers of the church got their description of 12 fruits of the Holy Spirit, because there's three more verses. And I'll read those real quick, because they're very telling. Verse 24, the very next verse, after St. Paul listing those nine fruits, he says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. Well, what's that? That's chastity. That's not normally mentioned in the, in the first nine, but it's added in the bigger group of twelve. There it is, chastity. And then he says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also follow the Spirit. What's that? That's goodness. That's real goodness. Evilness, that's me following my will. Goodness, that's when, that's when I follow his will, when I follow his spirit. That's goodness. Then the, the last verse of that chapter, let us not be conceited, provoking one another, envious of one another. What's that? That's modesty. Don't be conceited. Be modest. And that's where that twelfth fruit comes from, of modesty. But all of these fruits, really, they are dimensions of love. The love that we see in the God-man that's reflected in Mary and came first from the Father. One author I was reading, he's a beautiful author, his name is Derek Prince. He's a beautiful uh, Protestant minister who's gone to his reward, but he was very Catholic in his wisdom and his intelligence and incredibly fruitful in his ministry. And reading one of his books, he described the fruits this way as parts of love. He says, of course, he says, love, the primary form of fruit, is listed first in the Holy Bible. But the other fruits that follow may be understood as different ways in which the fruit of love manifests itself. You might say like different brands of apples. You have one brand of apple, another one, and a third one from different parts of the country. Different brands of the same uh, of apples or oranges. Well, he says all the other fruits are really forms of love. So he says, joy is love rejoicing, and peace 
is love that is resting. And patience is love that is forbearing. And kindness is love that's serving others. And he says goodness is love seeking only what is best for others. Not what I want, but what's good for them. Faithfulness is my love keeping its promises. Gentleness is love ministering to the hurts of others. It's very tender. And self-control, he says, is love and control. So this is his way, Derek Prince, of describing the fruits of the Holy Spirit, how they all are beautiful variations of the one major fruit of love. And so this is, in a certain sense, this is the task of life, that we become men and women of a divine and heavenly love. And that way, when we're called home, we'll fit right in. Heaven is for those who bear fruit. And those who don't bear fruit, that's kind of scary. Don't even want to talk about it right now for those who don't bear fruit, who, as Jesus said in another parable, they take the talent that God gave them, the coin, and they, they put it in a hole and they bury it. They never make any fruitfulness come from it. And so we have a task to take what God has given to us and to multiply it. We are in the task of multiplication. He gives us seeds, we give him fruit. He mm -hmm. gives me more seed, I give him more fruit. So we're in a, we have a job here of multiplying. That's our job. He starts it, he baptized us, there's no charge, it was free of charge. And he won that for us on the cross, that great gift of sanctifying grace, of new life within us. And then he showers us with grace as it's raining right now. He showers us with these graces all through our life. And our job is to let them soak through us. And then to use these graces of wisdom and understanding and knowledge and counsel to know how to move, how to speak, how to act in such a way that, that I bring comfort to others and I bring others to God. And so a multiplication is meant to happen in me. And we're like little, little tiny representatives of God on the earth. And the fruits of the Holy Spirit have an added uh, function for us in that they allow me to see or to measure where I'm at. And so you might say that I can take a quick look at my life. Um, it's good to have a spiritual director or a confessor to help us, you know, or even a very good holy friend to be objective with us. But I really need to look at my life and see, uh, are these fruits uh, present within me? One that really you know, glares at me when I look at the list is patience. And in our time, like when we're seeing these riots on the streets of many major cities, including Atlanta, uh, I mean, what is that but, among other things, total impatience with others and with the system? not to give the system a chance to work and to pray, you know, for the judges and for the police officers and to pray for everything to work well and to forgive. But a whole lack of patience we see in our country right now and a lack of kindness. We need to look at our lives and see, do I have these 12 aspects of love? And for myself as a spiritual director, as a confessor, one that always sticks out to me personally throughout my whole priesthood is the fruit of joy. And we don't want to kid ourselves. If we are not joyful Catholics, uh, there's something dead inside of us. There's something dead. Because one saint said that joy is the surest sign of the presence of God. Joy is the surest sign of the presence of God. And so the loving God, the God who is love, is also the God of joy. Joy is a natural fruit of love. When we look at these 12 fruits of the Holy Spirit, and another one you might say would be modesty or chastity, boy, that's important in our time. And not to condemn anybody, it seems to me like our enemy, Lucifer, Satan, I've seen that fellow face to face. He's really nasty. That he's attacking our country. 
and really the whole world through our country, with the impurity and the, the pornography and even the movies from Hollywood, he's directly attacking this fruit of the Holy Spirit of modesty and chastity. And we have to look at our own lives, all of us do, that am I keeping a strict chastity and a holy modesty? Because that's what preserves love. If you put, you know, mud, you put you put dirt in water, it becomes muddy water, you can't drink it anymore. It's really good for nothing. There may be water, but now it's been ruined by the mud, by the dirt. If we put the dirt of impurity in our lives, it muddies the pure water of love. And love is no longer present. It's something, it's a perversion of love. And so all of these fruits, they make our love perfect. They prepare us for heaven, and they make us like God. They are good measuring rods for all of us to ask ourselves, maybe with the help of a spiritual director, am I truly following my beautiful Jesus? Well, let me look. Am I patient? Am I joyful? Am I pure? Am I faithful to my promises to others? Am I gentle? Am I generous with my money, with my time, with my goods? Am I generous? Well, you know, I thank God then for this list of the 12 fruits of the Holy Spirit. Because I would say on any given day, you can look at them, and you know exactly what you have to work on that day. Mm -hmm. Just by going through them, you know exactly what it is. Whether it's charity or joy or peace, am I peaceful? Or do I spread anxiety wherever I go? Am I patient? Am I kind? Am I good? Uh, do I seek what is good, not what is mediocre or bad? Am I generous? Am I gentle? Am I faithful? Am I modest? Am I clothing? In my words? And even what I look at, am I modest? Do I have self-control or do I indulge myself? And am I chaste, faithful to my state of life? I tell you what thank God for these 12 fruits because they show me with the help of my spiritual director even with a little nudge from the Holy Spirit exactly where I need to grow. It's in a way it's a little bit frightening because our sweet Jesus who is as St. Louis de Montfort said he is eternal wisdom he is perfect wisdom but Jesus told us that the eyes are the mirror of the soul and so when I look at something impure, whether it's on the computer or on HBO or even if it's walking down the street, and I look at that, then it, it enters my soul, and that's frightening. And most of us have had an experience of this, if, if even just for a second, where maybe when we were younger especially, but we let something in our eyes and we found it haunting us down the hallways of our life for weeks, if not years. Just one image, perhaps. But our eyes are absolutely precious. And that's why the Lord said, if your eyes are the cause of your sin, pluck them out, he said. Pluck them out. Well, does he really want you to pluck them out? Well, if it keeps you from hell, yes. But really what he's getting at is, make your eyes die to sin. Mm -hmm. And there was a beautiful saint in Cuba, St. Anthony Mary Claret. Sometimes they say Claret, St. Anthony Mary Claret. And he was the um, Archbishop of, of Cuba, a great missionary priest and a great son of Mary. But he was known to keep his eyes on the ground. He was one of the holiest men who ever lived. His heart was enlarged with love for God. You could hear his heart beating and throughout the whole cathedral. You could hear his heart beating. It was so pounding with love for Jesus and for Mary. Well, he was able to make his love grow. And the fruits of the Holy Spirit grow because he kept his eyes clean. He kept them always pure. He never looked up, afraid that he would see, you know, a, a woman who was too beautiful or who maybe was not dressed properly. Or perhaps there were other things, too, that would have tempted him. Maybe like a, a wealthy house. Sometimes we, we sometimes envy somebody else's house. But our eyes truly are windows or even doorways to the soul. And when we let in things that are impure, we're, it's, an, it's a perversion of love. It's like, it's like taking a poison 
voluntarily taking a poison, take a little bit at a time, that poison will kill me. And so in our time, we're being, we're being attacked everywhere we go. With billboards, you see, and by Times Square in New York City is awful. But we see that or even in the, the big cities of our country, in Atlanta too, we see it in Europe, horrible, horrible, horrible billboards mm-hmm. and magazines. And the way that so many people dress today, I don't mean to come down on the women, but it's the women have to be super careful how they dress. But I was looking at some scenes of the rioting in several cities over the last couple of days, and the way that some of the ladies were dressed is absolutely horrendous. And so women have a special responsibility, I would say, to help the men in their lives to keep their souls clean by keeping their eyes pure. So modesty is very, very important because without it, we put lust over love. Without modesty, we start valuing lust over love. And then the women in my life become things, not persons. They start becoming objects or things and not persons. And you know what that is? That's called hatred. Mm-hmm. So isn't that amazing that the perversion of the sexual gift, which is a beautiful gift from God, meant to express a holy and committed love between a man and a woman, when that gift is toyed with, it's not a toy. So when it's toyed with, something breaks. Something bad begins to happen. A poison enters our soul, and people stop becoming people. They start becoming things. I start wanting to use people to get the thing that I want, the pleasure. Instead of using things to love people, we start, u- we start using people to get the things and the pleasures we want. So modesty of our eyes is incredibly important because the, the eye is a window or a doorway. It will let a poison into our spirit immediately. It will begin to hijack the fruits of the Holy Spirit and make it much harder for me to say yes to God and, and to the one who needs me. Why don't we, um, first of all, begin with the traditional prayer to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle within us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who, by the light of the Holy Spirit, you did instruct the hearts of your faithful, Grant us by the same Holy Spirit that we may be made truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolations through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the God of all love, the God of great fruitfulness, may he be your closest companion and fill you with his own fruits. May you one day receive eternal life on high. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.